I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zinner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Zeitgeist in downtown Duluth is presenting its first independent production beginning this weekend with the regional premiere of The Realistic Joneses. The award-winning Lake Superior Magazine is under new ownership. We will talk with the old and new owners tonight. And we'll have the latest business news and learn about some new programming here at WDSE WRPT. Stay where you are. Almanac North is next. Hello and welcome again to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, we're going to be covering a lot of political stuff over the next couple of months, but not tonight. No, it's all fun and games tonight. <laughs> In fact, it's a fairly eclectic uh, night tonight, so we got a pretty good mix. Let's All get right. started. All right. Thank you, Danny, and welcome, everyone. The Zeitgeist Building in downtown Duluth is known as a center for the arts and creative people, but it has mostly acted as a host site for arts produced by other organizations. This week, Zeitgeist unveiled its first independent production staged in the Zeitgeist Teatro Theater. Joining us now is Bill Payne, director of The Realistic Joneses, and Tony Cuneo is the executive director of Zeitgeist, and thanks to both of you for being here. Uh, Tony, Zeitgeist's first independent production, why is that significant? Well, you know, I, to be exact, it's not necessarily our first independent production, but we are experimenting a little bit with a different brand. Historically, we've worked, uh, uh, generally when we produce shows, it's uh, with our Renegade brand, and it's a mm -hmm. program of Zeitgeist. Uh, but uh, with this show, we wanted uh, to try a couple things a little differently. We wanted to see uh, if we sort of uh, sell it under the Zeitgeist name uh, and uh, bring in sort of a consortium of actors and, and creative talent that have been working for years to put the show together, uh, we maybe could appeal to a, a, some new audience mm -hmm. and, uh, and tell a story a little differently than some stories we've told in the past. Mm -hmm. So Bill, good question here. What's the theme then of the realistic Joneses? Uh, the play is about uh, two couples, both named Jones, and in each of the couples, um, the, the the man in the couple is dealing with a degenerative nerve disease, and and it's about uh, how they deal with it, and it is a hel an hilarious comedy. <laughs> okay, it uh, doesn't sound hilarious. Well, <laughs> the, the, uh, you, you got to set that up and just say, Will you know, is a fabulous writer. This is a very important new American play, and and uh, it's about a lot of things. It's about um, what it means to, to live, to be married, to deal with life and death, mm. death issues. But it does it through incredible humor. Mm -hmm. well. As a director, what interested you in staging this production? A couple of things. This is unique for me. I've been directing plays for a long time. And these uh, actors had found this play, and they came to me and said, would you direct us in this play? And so usually I'm the one who finds the play, and then I go find the actors. Uh, but the script is, uh, is really phenomenal. Uh -huh. It's really smart. It's 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 expansive, it's beautiful, and it is hilarious. It's yeah. a really funny play. Tony, how does live theater benefit a community? Well, you know, I mean, I think at Zeitgeist, a lot of what we try and do is tell the stories of our community and connect people through shared experience. And so live theater is one of the ways of exploring what it means to be alive and, and to struggle and to succeed. and. Uh, Few plays capture that as well as the realistic Jones is it. I saw it last night, and it's not just a script; it's the talent that is assembled to put it together. It was the whole creative team. It was really uh, a show unlike almost any other I've seen in town, and that's great because those are the kind of stories we want to make sure uh, there is room to be told. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, does the title come at all from keeping up with the Joneses and that that idea that maybe there's there are things going on in their lives that we don't necessarily want to keep up with or don't know about? I think the idea that uh, Jones is a pretty common name, uh -huh. these are real people. Um, they have, they're, they're not, they're not uh, special, they're rather ordinary. And that idea that everyday people have live lives and that they're significant, 
uh, sometimes even in the most mundane ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's that's really that that we're all Joneses. Who, who then is the target audience for this play? Uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that people who've lived a little bit of life, uh, people who've been married for a while, people who've been caregivers. Um, uh, but you know, we've had, had some young people in the audiences, and they get it too. Uh, they they acknowledge that sometimes being over forty or over fifty, um, uh, they don't understand that. But but I certainly get it, uh, having lived a, a life and and understanding some of the things that they're coping with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill, you mentioned the that the actors came to you with this production. Talk a bit about the cast. We we do have some pictures from the production. So so the cast includes Mary Fox who is the artistic director of Renegade, but she's mm -hmm. a fine actor. Uh, Zach Stouffer, who's also been a Renegade uh, uh, regular. But also John Pukshevinsky, uh, who recently played Willie Loman at the Underground, and Christine Winkler Johnson. And John and Christine appeared together in a production called Annapurna uh, several years back. These are mature, experienced uh, people with professional, uh, uh, professional approach mm -hmm. to theater. The two designers were John Brophy, who's a uh, a member of the Renegade Ensemble and Sasha Howell. Uh, these are former students of mine, but now they're uh -huh. uh, they're you know grown up and professionals doing their thing that we trained them to do at UMD, and and to have that group of people plus Katie Jacobson, our stage manager, was our eighth member of the team. Uh -huh. But we're just eight people, mm -hmm. and we started working on this play a year and a half ago. Bill, are we seeing a renaissance in local live theater, or has it always been there, and maybe some people just haven't noticed? It's, it, when I showed up here 25 years ago, I noticed that there was more theater and arts in this community than one would suspect really? for a town of 85,000. That being said, in the last 15 years, theater has boomed. More professionals and more uh, uh, passionate community theater artists are choosing to stay here. Uh, our graduates are graduating and they love living in Duluth so much they stay. Uh, but there are more outlets. The, the North Shore opening, the Playhouse schedule, uh, Wise Fool Theater, uh, the Renegade, and now Zeitgeist provides an opportunity for groups like ours, another option to put together a show that we're passionate about and, and have the resources and the, and, the, and the place to put it on. Sure. <laughs> of course, Zeitgeist is right in the heart of the, the Duluth Arts District. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that the, that area is a, as robust as you expected it to be? Yeah, I mean, I think it takes time and energy to, uh -huh. you know, really build a sort of sustainable arts district uh, in, in the downtown. But it's been really fun to watch people come to the North Shore and then come to Zeitgeist afterwards or see shows at Zeitgeist and then go to the North Shore. And um, yeah, we want more of that. And, uh, and on those nights where downtown is hopping, it's mm -hmm. a great energy. And it's uh -huh. Duluth gives you the best of, of all things. And we have that kind of culture yeah. and, and arts and entertainment along with everything else you get in Duluth. Mm -hmm. Bill, what can I expect to take away from this play once the curtain closes? Well, your face will hurt from laughing, <laughs> okay? But you'll also be thinking about things. Well, what we found working on the script is that it just reminds us of real life. And that's where the title comes from, the realistic Joneses. It, it reminds you of real life situations you've been in, the lines pop up in your life, and you go, wow, this is real. And I think that's really special, a lot of scripts tend to, uh, to miss that when they're trying to portray life as it is. But this script captures it. But be ready to laugh. It's really funny. Huh. And there are plenty of performances uh, still, so people have yes. an opportunity to, to see the realistic Joneses over the next couple of weekends. It, it runs uh, tomorrow night and Sunday, and then uh -huh. we have two more weekends of shows. Uh, Wednesday night, because Zeitgeist is all about access, uh -huh. Wednesday night, September 19th, is a pay-what-you-can night. So if the, if the ticket price is a little bit too much, Come and pay what you can. All right, we'll have website information up. Thanks so much for coming in. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you both. It. Well, perhaps you heard Lake Superior Magazine is under new management after the iconic publication was sold to the publishers of Business North and Scenic Range News Forum. The sale officially went through on August 31st. Joining us now to talk about the transition are Cindy and Paul Hayden, longtime owners of Lake Superior Magazine, <laughs> 
And Ron Brochu of Business North is the new owner, along with his business partner, Beth Biley. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Ron, I understand that uh, Beth is under the weather tonight, so she couldn't be here. A little bit of laryngitis. Okay, we hope she's feeling better. And Cindy and Paul, you've been running the, the magazine now since about 1984. 84. You're, you're mm -hmm. stepping away. Was it hard to make this decision? No. No, it, it's hard to leave because there's more potential today than when we started, but it's time. It's time to send it off to a new generation, new energy, and a new direction. So. Mm -hmm. Paul, well, what, what, are, what are your plans now as you leave the magazine? Are you going to retire and just kind of sit down and take it easy for a while? <laughs> yeah, there's nobody I've ever talked to that said when they retired they didn't do anything. That's right. When you retire, you just change what you do. So I think um, we'll find things to do, no Good. problem. Yep. Uh, Ron, what made you interested in purchasing the magazine? Have you been thinking about it for a while, or did the opportunity just arise? Well, both. Uh, in the first place, I, I had seen your presentation a few years ago to the chamber okay. announcing that that you were uh, approaching retirement yeah. and, and sale. But it's, you know, we were in the same building and uh, got to know each other yeah. and uh, it's a very high quality publication. And uh, uh, Beth and I were have been lucky in that we have purchased two very high quality publications uh, at a time when the media is struggling and uh, you know the first time around we were lucky everything worked out right and we uh, didn't make a lot of changes and we knew what our readers wanted and we saw an opportunity to do the same mm -hmm. thing here. Mm -hmm. Paul what do you think uh, Lake Superior magazine accomplished over all of those years? You know, when we we started, uh, not a lot of people knew about the magazine, and a lot of people s knew we had a big lake out there, but they sort of turned their back to it. Didn't know a lot about the lake either, did no. they? No. And uh, I think one of the things we've helped to do is to introduce different communities around the lake to each other. Uh, in the process, people began to respect the lake a little more. and. Um, these days, people look at the lake as something they want to visit, they want to cherish. Uh, they really want to come here. Mm -hmm. And I think we had a lot to do with getting their interest higher. Um, we don't want to take all the credit, only 90% of it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, did publishing the magazine change the relationship that you had with Lake Superior? Oh, absolutely. You mm -hmm. know, people who knew my father knew that he was a Lake Superior person all the way, but I had couldn't wait to get out of Duluth. I left when I was 18 and I wasn't ever coming back. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> here I am, many years later. Um, but there was so much about the lake I didn't know. I really think the secret to our success, though, is the fact that we've had journalists to, right from the beginning, from Barb Landfield to Paul's editorial sure. to Connie LeMay and Connie and Ron worked together at the Statesman when they were at UMD. Uh -huh. The journalist background has what has truly been the underpinning of getting our success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Ron, do you plan then to hang on to the professional staff that's already set up there? Uh, any big changes do you see in the in the immediate future? No, uh, we we will stick with uh, the folks that have made this what it is, and uh, it's in very good hands. A lot of skilled people. I'm I know some of them, like Connie and Bob Berg, and uh, some I don't. But uh, I, after only one week, I know that they all are very dedicated, hardworking folks and uh, wouldn't change it for the world. Mm -hmm. and, and the the lake itself is a, a huge economic driver, so I imagine you're pretty familiar with a lot of the communities and the stories from Business North. Uh, will, will there be a little bit of overlap, do you think? I, th I think there always is an overlap. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, uh, you know, because of the economy that goes with the big lake and uh, you know, it, it drives just a large amount of tourism and uh, shipping, and and uh, it, that can't be ignored. So, uh, but I think we'll pretty much keep each uh, mag each publication's identity separate. Mm -hmm. It's a so little bit of a different ball game. Sydney, what was your father's vision when the magazine first began? He was so proud of the entire region. He was a lifelong Duluthian. He 
the point the magazine started was in 1979, and he got involved in 81, 82, which is when the air base was closing, when the steel plant was closing, when the billboard, the famous billboard of turning out the lights, and mm -hmm. he just loved the fact that Tom Jesperson's photos portrayed how beautiful the region was when everyone was feeling so down about the region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, that he always had that vision, and of course, photography is our hallmark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, in addition to good writing, Lake Superior Magazine is known for its wonderful pictures. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. it, it absolutely is what people talk about all the time. So we're still on very high quality, a very expensive paper, but that's the, that's the quality we want to deliver. Yeah. And we know Ron and Beth will continue that. We know that they have the same high journalistic standards that we've always had. And it's just exciting that we're putting it into the hands of real professionals. You're read in foreign countries, too. Oh, all over. Yes, it, this week alone, we've had people from uh, Germany, from Japan and a uh, third country and about 17 states in our offices this week wow. that come to find out about the Lake Superior Circle Tour. Tremendous mm -hmm. audience. Mm -hmm. Ron, with Business North, you have lived through this transition from just being a print publication to also having a, a big online presence. Um, where do you see the internet fitting into uh, Lake Superior Magazine as you move forward? Well, I think you have to watch the trends uh -huh. and obviously there is some momentum going toward more digital media. And, uh, you know, there's already a presence there that's been developed. And, uh, you know, with web page and, and newsletters. Uh, I think things will keep trending that way. But on the other hand, with a, a magazine that leans toward photography, I don't think that demand will, will go away. People. S a lot of people still want to have that. They want to get away from their their uh, smartphones at times and <laughs> and be in a quiet setting and just really en enjoy what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, will you also be continuing with uh, Lake Superior Magazine's merchandising? Is that a, a new area for you? It is new. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but learning is fun. And, uh, you know, when you quit learning, you know, something's wrong. So it's sure. it's a challenge. But it's a challenge that uh, we're going to tackle, and and uh, it uh, it will be fun. Good, Ron. All the best with the Lake Superior Magazine. Paul, Cindy, thank you for bringing us such a quality magazine for all these years, and thanks for being here tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Let's turn now to the business news from our friends at Business North. Lake Superior College President Dr. Patrick Johns will retire next June after 42 years in the Minnesota State Colleges and University System. Johns began his career in 1977 at Masabi Community College, serving as financial aid director and counselor. He was named LSC president in 2010, only the third president to serve the Duluth College since the merger with Duluth Technical College in 1995. Throughout his career, he has served eight years as a faculty member, five years as a dean, and 29 years as a president, including the past eight at LSC. Two lawsuits have been filed against Husky Energy in connection with an April explosion and fire at its superior refinery. A class action lawsuit includes at least three plaintiffs who are seeking damages related to economic and other losses they claim to have suffered. Another civil action filed by a Houston law firm contends the worksite was unsafe for contract employees. Husky also has been settling claims submitted directly to the company in connection with the incident, which led to an evacuation of nearby neighborhoods. 
Adams Publishing Group, which owns newspapers across the Iron Range and northwestern Wisconsin, has expanded its media holdings. Adams purchased the assets of Cook Communications in Greenville, North Carolina, and in Key West, Florida. Launched in, in 2013, the group focuses on smaller communities and has grown to include 27 daily newspapers and more than 100 non-dailies in 15 states. Led by Chief Executive Mark Adams, the company also is affiliated with Good Sam, Camping World, and Gander Outdoors. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Well, we have run out of time this week, but you can still call with a comment. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org and visit the WDSC website for our latest on our program schedule, news about your favorite PBS shows, and other things coming up here at the station. And Julie, we'll have to enjoy these remaining days of summer weather before it's too late. Enjoy them. I think it's uh, time for that end of the summer yard work. Mow your lawn one last time. Staining the deck Stain tomorrow. Stain your deck. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Always something. For Julie and the crew here at WDSC, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.